Welcome back to the online FASA Metroid seminar. Today, we're happy to have Raphael Steiner from ETH Zurich. Take it away, Raphael. Yeah, thanks for having me here. Uh, so in this presentation, I will talk about uh, hypergraph coloring uh, for hypergraphs with, that exclude a minor. And uh, yeah, I guess there, there's some things to define here because I don't think that minors for hypergraphs are a standard notion. Uh, uh, so yeah, let me let me. So so the first half of the talk will first explain the setup of my of my results, and then I, I will talk about uh, the new results I have. Um, so this first slide looks a bit technical, but it just contains a formal definition of what I, how, how I look at minors, at graph minors. So this is normal graphs, no hypergraphs yet. Um, so, so for graphs G1 and G2, um, the following is like a formal template for having the graph G2 as a minor in the graph G1, uh, which I guess most of you know, but uh, I just will fix this terminology so, so that no one gets confused. So a G2 minor model in the graph G1 it's just like a collection of disjoint vertex subsets of the graph uh, G1, which are indexed by the vertex of G2. So every vertex, every vertex in G2 gets mapped to a non-empty subset of vertices uh, in G1 uh, in such a way that these, the, these subsets, these are called branch sets, uh, induce connected subgraphs of G1 in the sense that if I contract all the edges inside of them, I will receive a single vertex, or I will get a single vertex. Uh, and similarly, since I want this to be a minor model, uh, if I contract the edges inside these branches, what I would like to have is that for every connection I want to have in this minor G2 between two vertices U and V, there should at least uh, should at least be one edge between the corresponding branches B U and B V in the graph G1. So that's a, a formal definition. So a minor model is just a, this collection of subsets corresponding to vertices in G2 with these properties, and then uh, this is a certificate that G1 contains G2 as a minor. So that's uh, uh, equivalent. A graph G1 contains another graph G2 as a minor in the typical sense by the lesion and edge contraction, if and only if in G1 we can find a, a minor model of G2. Um, okay, so after having introduced this uh, formal view of minors, which I will use throughout the talk and also apply to hypergraphs and so on. Uh, yeah, let me, okay, let me first quickly give an example because this looked a bit technical. So for example, if I want to find a K4 minor in a graph, uh, the kind of structure I'm looking for is this K4 minor model, which consists of four vertex disjoint subsets, each and using some connected subgraph. And between any pair of these subsets, I will have at least one edge in a graph. So anything, any structure like this showing up as a substructure in a graph certifies a K4 minor. Uh, okay. Um, so let me now come to the motivational part of, of this talk, I guess, or also the background part. So obviously, my results are inspired by Hartwig's conjecture, which is a problem. Uh, I really like and uh, like to think about. So it's a very old conjecture uh, proposed by Hugo Hartwig, who was a Swiss mathematician in 1943. And it uh, claims a very interesting relation between uh, the containment of clique minors in graphs and the, their chromatic number. So you might ask uh, for the chromatic number of a, of a graph, class of graphs, which exclude a fixed graph as a minor, uh, for example, a clique. And uh, Hartwig conjectured that if you uh, exclude a complete graph on T vertices as a minor, then the chromatic number should be at most t minus one. And clearly this bound is best possible because a clique of one smaller order will not contain the KT as a minor and have chromatic number t minus one. And the uh, Hartwig's conjecture is very interesting because if it is true, then you can de exactly determine the chromatic number of a proper minor closed class of graphs just by looking at the largest clique contained in the class. So in some sense, you could say this is a weak perf perfectness theorem uh, for minor closed graph classes. If it would be a theorem, it's not a theorem yet. Um, in any case, let me quickly summarize the partial results, which are known for Hartwig's conjecture. Uh, so this has been proved for t up until six, uh, and the most well-known case of it is t equals five because there it uh, generalizes the four color theorem. Uh, K five minor three graphs include all the planar graphs, so if we know that they are four colorable. The four color theorem is true, and the, however, the, the way we know that the, it's, it is true for t equals five is not by uh, some are really using the fact that we are K5 minor three directly, but rather there's a, a structure theorem by Wagner, which says that K5 minor three graphs are structurally very similar to planar graphs. And from this, you can just uh, reduce this to the uh, four color theorem. And similarly for T equals six, Robertson, Seaman, and Thomas in 1993 reduced the uh, Hartwig's conjecture to the four color theorem as well, but this was much more complicated. And uh, yeah, uh, I will not talk about the details. Um, 
So since this seems very hard and already uh, open for TQL7 up until now, uh, people focus more on the asymptotic version for now. So they try to prove a linear upper bound on a quadratic number, given the same assumption that the graph is KT minor three. Uh, and for a long time, the best uh, standing asymptotic bound was T times square root log T, which just uh, follows from a result by uh, results by Kostoska and Tomazon, uh, proved 1984 that every graph without a KT minor has a vertex of degree at most of that order. And then you can inductively, I mean, you can remove such a vertex of low degree, inductively color the rest of the graph, and then put it back. And because it doesn't have many neighbors, you can find a color for it, which doesn't show up on its neighborhood. So this is uh, the, the so-called degeneracy approach for coloring. And uh, the, the, the annoying thing about it is that this square root log t factor is actually necessary for this degeneracy approach. There are graphs with no KT minor, which have that as a minimum degree. Uh, so you cannot really directly improve upon this result. Uh, just by using the using degeneracy of graphs of no KT minor. And for a long time, no one knew how to improve this approach. And then uh, in 2009, in Noreen, Post, and Song had a breakthrough result where they improved the log T to the one half uh, factor to a log T to the one quarter, basically. And then there was a sequence of other papers by Noreen and Post, and uh, uh, the uh, Song, uh, a subset of these authors, and uh, uh, culminating in the state of the art results now by the Kuh and Post from 2021. Uh, which reduced this uh, exponent of the log t basically to an epsilon, so it's now t times log log t, which is even much smaller and very close to linear bound. So, so that's the state of the art for the asymptotic version uh, and for the precise version, and uh, we don't really know much more. Um, uh, so, so this wraps up the, the history of Hardwick's conjecture and our current state of the art. Um, now, let me turn to hypergraphs. And uh, just to make sure that we are all on the same page here, I think this is quite a standard notion by now, but uh, let me define what is the coloring and the chromatic number of a hypergraph. So it's, it's really defined in the same way as for graphs. So if you have a hypergraph, which is just a pair V, E, where V is a finite vertex set and E is a subset, uh, a set of subsets of V. So these are the so-called hyper edges. Um, and we all, throughout this talk, I will always assume that hypergraphs don't contain singleton sets. So there's no loops in hypergraphs because I will talk about coloring and coloring Having loops makes not much sense. Uh, so suppose you have a hypergraph about loops, then the k coloring of the hypergraph is just a, an assignment of colors from one up to k to each vertex, such that if you look at any fixed color class, so you look at all the vertices of one fixed color i, then this should form an independent set in the hypergraph. But in other words, this means uh, an, so an independent set in the hypergraph is simply a set vertices containing not fully including any hyper edge. So in other words, a proper k coloring is simply a coloring where no single hyper edge receives or uh, is, is, um, is monochromatic. And then similarly as for graphs, the chromatic number of a chi of h is the smallest k for which such a k coloring exists. So this generalizes the chromatic number and it's, it's very natural notion. Uh, you can think of these edges in the hypergraph as some sort of conflict and you want to avoid a monochromatic conflict. That's a very general setup. Um, now, I told you that I want to talk about some sort of generalization of Hartwig's conjecture to, to the hypergraph setting. And in order to make that work, I also need to introduce uh, minors for hypergraphs. And surprisingly, I mean, obviously, I, I looked into the internet uh, and uh, looked for, like, is there any standard notion in a standard work on this? And there definitely do exist notions of minors for hypergraphs, actually various such notions, but uh, not really in the sense uh, that would be most natural for, for the kind of generalization I, I want to go for here. So uh, I found some definition uh, of minus for uh, clutters. So a clutter is a hypergraph where no two edges contain each other. And there, the, the operations you can do is you delete a vertex and the hyper edge is containing it, I think. And the other operation is that you uh, delete the vertex, but then you shrink the hyper edges. So you remove the vertex simply from the hyper edges. Uh, and this is, I think these two uh, notions together, it can also be seen as some kind of a, of a minor notion. Uh, in particular, this also generalizes matrix minus uh, matrix minus in some way. So there's one notion like this. There, there are many other notions. Um, also, there's a notion for minus uh, for uh, simplicial complexes uh, introduced by several people in several various forms, and I, I cannot address them here. Uh, I will just say that there, there are many notions of minus in some form for graphs, but the notion uh, I will introduce here I haven't seen anywhere. But I think it's I actually believe that for, for it's the the most straightforward generalization of of uh, graph minus com coming from a graph perspective to hypergraphs. And, and here's the definition. So if H1 and H2 are hypergraphs, I say that H1 contains H raised a minor, if and only if I can obtain, starting from H1, some hypergraph isomorphic to H2 just by doing the standard operations. So standard operations here, are, I can delete something 
which means it's either deleting a vertex and all the hyper edges and removing all the hyper edge edges which contain it, deleting a single hyper edge, or contracting a hyper edge. And by contracting, you it's really the intuitive thing which you would think it is. So I take the, the whole hyper edge, I identify all the points contained in the hyper edge into one point. And for any other hyper edges which were basically overlapping with this hyper edge which I'm contracting, um, the corresponding points they contained of this hyper edge also shrink into the same vertex. So uh, I don't formally define this here, but there, there will be an example here in the next slides. So I, th I think it's very intuitively very clear what I mean by this. So, so let's see how I can build some minor of this hypergraph here. Uh, so I, I use the standard notion of uh, drawing like these bubbles or potatoes around uh, vertices and meaning that these are hyper edges. I, I think it, I hope that is clear. Um, so, so let's start from this hypergraph and let's build some minor according to my definition. So uh, first, I told you, I can, sometimes we can kill vertices. And killing vertices, in this case, and this is very important, when I remove a vertex, in this case, this, the vertex at the bottom with the cross, I will not just remove the vertex itself and then shrink the other hyper edges, which some people do and use this as a definition of, definition of deletion, but it's very important for me that I don't allow this. When I remove a vertex, I have all the hyper edges containing the vertex have to, re, have to be removed as well. So it's really like an induced, doing this is really like taking an induced subgraph in the, of the hypergraph. So in this case, if I remove this vertex, I, all the hyper edges containing this vertex disappear. And all these vertices here become isolated. So for, for my uh, purpose here, I might, might as well also kill all these isolated vertices. And now, now let's see how, how our contraction looks. So let's, for example, select this hyper edge here. Um, as I said, what I simply do is I shrink all these four vertices in the hyper edge into one single vertex. And all the other hyper edges overlapping with it uh, will also, in, instead of having the corresponding vertices in the overlap, have this contracted vertex. And then I can do this again with this hyper edge, maybe it looks like this. Now what we end up, uh, ended up with is actually, uh, if you look at this, I mean, it looks a bit ugly, but it's actually just a graph because every hyper edge is of size two, so that's a K3 here. So I, I showed you a sequence of uh, minor operations which transformed this complicated hypergraph into a K3. So this hypergraph contains K3 as a minor. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, so now let's, let's, let's take a step back and let's look at this uh, initial picture of the hypergraph. And think about how, how could we find it. Let's think about minor models and for this hypergraph definition and uh, how did we find this minor. So what we all we did is basically deleted some uh, vertices and edges, and then we contracted these two red edges and we kept in the end uh, the union of the. I mean, basically we contracted those two red edges. They, they created one uh, contraction vertex and then there were were the other were these other two red vertices and only these three vertices in the end remained and gave us a K three. So if I want to express the minimal information which is required to tell us why this contains a K3 minor, uh, I, I can just look at these, at these things here. And in particular, all I care about is that these three blue sets um, were connected in the hypergraph so that I could contract them into single vertices. And also what I care about is that after having contracted these uh, blue sets into single vertices, there are these three graph edges between the sets, which is equivalent uh, to the fact that between any two blue, uh, any two blue sets, there was one hyper edge which was contained in a union of those two blue, set, blue sets and inter inter intersected both of them. So really all that mattered was that there were these three connected blobs of blue, blue things. And between any two blobs, there was one hyper edge intersecting both sets and contained in a union of the two sets. So this is basically what certified, this is a K3 minor model in the hypergraph setting. And uh, you can also make this a formal definition. This is what you get. It's, it's just the same as for graphs basically. So if I have, Hypergraph H1 and H2, an H2 minor model in H1 is again a branch set collection, so a collection of disjoint subsets of the vertex of H1, such that for every vertex in H2, I have one uh, non empty subset of vertices in H1, which induces a connected uh, sub hypergraph. And furthermore, if I have any, if I want to model a given edge, a hyper edge in H2, how does this model is that there has to exist a, a hyper edge in H1, such that uh, if I look at uh, those branch sets which are intersected by this edge E, it corresponds exactly to F, basically. So E should live in the union of the branch sets corresponding to this hyper edge F and H2, but also intersect every single one of these branch sets. And once I have such a minor model, again, just by contracting hyper edges inside all of these branch sets, because these are connected, I, they are shrinked uh, into single vertices. And then I get uh, something which contains uh, H2 um, as a sub hypergraph, basically. So this is again equivalent. You have a H1 has an H2 minor if and only if such a model exists. Okay, so this is, it's not hard to convince yourself of this fact. 
Um, and again, I have an ex example now. I take a, a, a minor of a something which is actually hypergraph and not a graph. So let's let's look at K for free. So this is a, a hypergraph on four vertices, which is free uniform and complete. So it contains all free vertex subsets. Uh, and this would be a K for free minor model. So you all you need is that you have um, okay, sorry. I have to say this picture is not complete. So, so when I'm these three blobs, they have to be connected. In my picture, they aren't. But like, just imagine that there are some additional hyper edges which make those uh, four blobs connected. So these should be four uh, disjoint induced uh, connected subhypergraphs. And then uh, for every triple of these uh, four branch sets, I want to have one hyper edge which lives in the union of these three branches and intersects each one of them at least once. Because then when you have these edges, after contracting the blue stuff, uh, you will get a K for free as a minor. OK, um, so I, I hope this is clear. So this is the, just a generalization of the ordinary graph minor notions to hypergraphs for my definition. And, and you can also talk about these branch sets and minor modes in the same way as for graphs. So now what I want to look at is uh, what are hypergraphs that, con that don't con contain a clique, so a, a KT a graph on T vertices as a minor. And, uh, you might ask at this point, why do I look at, in particular, excluding a KT or a graph as a minor and not a hypergraph? And the reason for that is that I would like to have a general statement which applies to all hypergraphs. I would like to have a statement which bounds the chromatic number of all hypergraphs, regardless of the size of hyper edges and so on, no, uniform, no uniformity conditions, um, excluding a fixed something as a minor. And if you want to do that, then you have to exclude a graph because, uh, in general, like these minor notions cannot uh, increase sizes of edges. The, if, if you were a graph in the, in the beginning, after performing minor operations, you are still a graph. So if you want to have something which bounds a chromatic number, you have to exclude KT or have to, have to exclude the graphs. Um, so that's why I'm going for the question, how do hypergraphs, in my definition, without a KT minor look like? And can we somehow say something about the chromatic number? And uh, the first thing you might be asking is a different question. Is, it is whether or not hypergraphs without a KT minor actually have a nice structure. Can, for, for, for graphs, if we ask what are proper minor closed classes, there, there is a nice structure theorem by Robertson uh, and Seymour for this um, that's very famous, graph minor structure theorem. And uh, using this theorem, we at least know that these graphs have a nice structure. For example, we know that they have vertices of small degree, as I told you on the previous slide. And this at least gives you some intuition that they should have a small chromatic number also. Uh, but I, I want to say a word of caution here, because this is not at all true for hypergraphs. So let me give you a construction of something which does not look at all like something which comes uh, from a structure theorem, or at least not the structure theorems we, we know of, but still doesn't have big KT minors. So what you do is you take any graph you want, as dense as you want. Let's say you take a complete graph, a huge complete graph. I cannot draw a huge complete graph, but let's just pretend K6 is that six is a, six is a huge number. So let's take a K, KN and take the one subdivision of it, right? So you place a vertex at the middle of each edge. And now we make every free vertex path consisting of two original vertices and the one new subdivision vertex on the edge, uh, we make this a hyper edge. So this is a free uniform hypergraph, which looks like this, right? So every edge now becomes basically a, a free edge. And I claim that no matter how you do this, no, no matter which graph you, uh, with, with which graph you start, this hypergraph will always be K2 minor free, <laughs> which is, <laughs> sounds ridiculous, but it's true. And the reason is very simple, because imagine you start doing any kind of contractions and deletions starting from this kind of hypergraph, then when you, when you contract a, some, one of these edges of size three, it will have the same effect as if you co uh, contracted the corresponding graph edge. So basically, you will just do graph mine operations all the time, and you will always stay within this class of graphs, of hypergraphs, which are obtained from a graph by doing this subdivision operation and then replacing edges by these free edges. And um, thus, even if you shrink up, uh, up, I mean, no matter how, you do, how long you do graph, up, uh, graph mine operations here, you will never be able to get a single edge because you will always stay a free uniform hypergraph. That's the point. You can never reduce the size of any edge by doing contractions here. So that's, that's uh, very strange because these graphs are, look very dense. They look structurally complex. And they are not sparse in the sense we would like them to be. But at least their chromatic number is very low, right? I mean, you can just give one color to all the original vertices. And one color to uh, one other color to all the subdivision vertices. So these these graphs are always too colorful. So it looks dangerous, but at least for chromatic number, these things are not dangerous. So there's still some hope in this uh, direction. So let me summarize this. So we, we cannot hope for the same nice structure we have of KT minor free graphs, 
in this hypergraph setting. Um, and we, even worse, this is something I cannot, I don't explain here, but I have a construction for it. I, I know that there are hypergraphs to you know KT minor that can have arbitrarily large minimum degree, even in a certain strong sense. Um, so so there also this degeneracy result does not translate to the hypergraph setting. So all these kind of things which are nice for graphs uh, with, a, with an excluded minor are not no longer true, but still there's hope for hypergraph coloring. We, uh, there's no construction. I didn't show you any construction with actually high, high, high chromatic number that excludes a KT minor. And so this uh, finally gets me to the interesting question I want to ask in this talk or discuss in this talk. This was the starting point of my research. Whether or not it is, it is true that if in general hypergraphs, the only condition I have that my hypergraphs don't have uh, loops, um, if I exclude KT as a minor, is it true that they have found a chromatic number? And this seems like such a general statement because I, I have no restriction on the hypergraphs whatsoever that you would maybe first expect it to be wrong. But actually, th this is maybe uh, the, the conceptual contribution of this talk is that this is actually um, has a positive answer. So in this talk, I will show that the answer is yes. Uh, KT minor free hypergraphs have found a chromatic number. And you can actually even say something uh, asymptotically about the maximum chromatic number h of t of a KT minor free hypergraph. So this h of t function is defined as the maximum chromatic number, chromatic number of a KT minor free hypergraph. And this is what I want to prove that it exists, first of all, and then also bound it in this talk. So I, I will obtain closed linear bounds. Um, Right. So that, that, that's the main contribution. And then I will also um, discuss some other aspects of this function. So my main result uh, proves uh, the, the fact that h of t exists by reducing to the graph case. So what I prove is that if g of t denotes a maximum critic number of kt minor free graphs, not hypergraphs, but graphs, then a kt minor free hypergraphs is, is always two times g of t colorable. So just by paying a factor of two, I can generalize from graph to hypergraph which is quite nice, at least for this asymptotic perspective, because I still get the, the same asymptotic bounds we have also for, for KT minor free graphs. So I get this T times log of T bound by the equivalent process as well. So that's first of all quite nice, I think. And then still we have to pay a factor of two and so on. So things are not quite exact. And the question raises itself uh, whether or not um, we can generalize Hartwig's conjecture to hypergraphs. So, so can we just, conjecture that maybe every KT minor free hypergraph is T minus one colorable or something like this. It would be very nice if it's possible. Um, we'll later see that it's actually not possible, not one to one, but I have some conjecture which um, which comes close to it. So 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 yeah, we will we'll see later what how, how how I mean what I can say about this problem. So yeah so this provision gives it away. So so what we cannot really hope for is the exact same t minus one bound as for Hartwig's conjecture, um, since there is a simple construction which took me a really long while to figure out. So for a long while, I, the best known lower bound I was uh, I knew was uh, t. So I knew that there are kt minor free hypergraphs which are not t minus one colorable but need one more color. But I, I didn't realize for a long time that actually you need even some some you have to pay some factor actually for hypergraphs. And the construction is very simple because it's just looking at complete free uniform hypergraphs, uh, and and decently give you a lower bound where you have to pay a free half factor, free half factor more than Hartwig's conjecture. So I'm claiming that if you look at a complete free uniform hypergraph on three times t minus one vertices, then this is a hypergraph of chromatic number three half times t minus one rounded up and doesn't have a kt minor. So this h of t function is separated away from t minus one, but at least it's three half factor. But up until now, this is the best construction I have. So I, I cannot prove a better lower bound. This. And this is quite easy to see. So let, 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 let me quickly tell you why this is true. So, and, and here the minor models are, are useful. So, so, so let's recall what this minor model would mean. So um, let's first argue that why H does not have a KT minor, right? So suppose there was a contradiction, H contains a KT minor. So it has this collection of T vertex disjoint uh, connected uh, subsets such that for every pair of two such subsets in their union, I can find a, a hyper edge intersecting both sets. That's what the, what the KT minor model means in my definition. Now, the crucial thing is that these sets should induce connected subsets of my uh, free uniform hypergraph. And there's a simple observation. Namely, there's, there's only one type of set which does not induce a connected hypergraph of a free new, complete free uni uniform hypergraph, which are the two vertex sets. If you just take two vertices, what they induce as a, as a sub-hypergraph is just a two vertex independent set. So these are not a, this is not a connected hypergraph. What would be connected is a single vertex or any set of at least three vertices. So I know already that each of my bi is either singleton or of size at least three. And now I wanted, uh, the other thing I want is that for any pair of two uh, such branches, there is a hyper edge living in their union, right? 
which tells me that there cannot be more than one singleton set because if I would have two different singletons, uh, these are just two vertices, so their union is of size two, and this is too small to host a hyper edge. Every hyper edge has size three, right? So I know that every BI is either a singleton or of size at least three, and at most one of them is actually a singleton. But this already is, is too bad because this means I need many vertices, right? I need at least one vertex for the singleton, and then there's T minus one other BI is left, for which each of them has to be a size at least three, so I need at least one more vertex than three times T minus one. So this cannot be contained in H. Such a model does not exist in H. So H is KT minus three, just because of space reasons, basically. But on the other hand, uh, I have three times T minus one vertices. And for every coloring, I cannot use a color more than twice. If I would use any color three times, uh, just three of these vertices uh, would form a hyper edge in this complete free uniform hypergraph. So every color can be, can be used at most twice in the coloring. So I need at least three times T minus one divided by too many colors, which is exactly the bound I'm claiming here. Right, so this is this is a separation of the hypergraph case of this problem, the graph case, and it's really for, for the mainly for this reason that the size two vertex sets cannot be connected in this construction. I, I guess you could change the definition of a hypergraph minor slightly, and then maybe you would still have hope for a for a tight result. But I, I still like my definition because it's as I said, I, I think maybe the most straightforward way of doing it. Okay, so so this is just a the surpri surprising lower bound. Um, now, now let's uh, let's quickly say <laughs> a conjecture here, which might be very strong and might be wrong and so on. But uh, I, I tried for quite a while now to to construct better lower bounds for this problem, and and I did manage. So what I really believe that maybe this is true that, that this lower bound I constructed here. I have many different extremal constructions actually. Um, is tight. So so that h of t equals three half times t minus one rounded up, and which means that every k t minus three hypergraph is exactly colorable using that many colors. Um, but I don't. I have only little evidence for it. I, I tried proving it in some special cases, but all I could come up with is a proof in the case of hypergraphs with independence number two. So if a hypergraph is very dense in the sense that there's no free vertices uh, uh, which are independent, um, then this conjecture is exactly true in this form. Um, and maybe why there's some. So, so the reason I looked at this is that actually. Graphs of flow and independence number are a notorious hard case for Hartwig's conjecture itself. They are very well known. There's a, a Hartwig's conjecture has not yet been proved for, hyper, for, for graphs of independence number two. And they are natural to look at because you get an easy lower bound on a quadratic number in these classes. There's a, something called the, C, the so called Seagull problem, which is just Hartwig restricted to these graphs, basically. Uh, and, and people still don't know how to prove it. And so I thought, okay, let's look for, for this conjecture outside this special case. And I just realized that basically the, the known tools from graph theory uh, with some additional uh, technical stuff from for hypergraphs, which I found in literature, uh, just uh, basically solves this in the special case. This is not a very insightful proof, and it's, it's not very difficult also, but uh, a bit technical. So I will, I will not show it in this talk, but I have some limited evidence, let's say, that this might be true. Uh, well, I, I couldn't come up with much more. I, I know it also in the t equals two case, actually not even for t equals three, I know that this is true, and I, this is one of my open questions, uh, but, but I hope it's true, and, and, and I like to conjecture things. Okay. Now, I told you a lot about what I think and what could be true and so on. Let me now give you actually proof. So let me prove you the main result that KT minor free hypergraphs are always colorable with at most a factor two times more than what we need for KT minor free graphs. And this proof is morally very similar to a proof I found like one or two years ago for a very similar problem on directed graph minors. And this is actually what inspired me to do, to do this whole research. Uh, and and I, basically, I just discovered that certain elements of the proof I had in the style graph setting were unnecessary, and uh, I could throw them out and then generalize it to this hypergraph setting. And I, I think I really think this hypergraph setting makes it much more appealing because it's a more general result. And as you will later see, I will show different applications of it for graphs, for example, um, which I wouldn't have known without this more general perspective in mind. OK, but now let me show you a proof, because I think it's nice and elegant. OK, so here's a proof. So suppose H is any given hypergraph without a KT minor. Um, let's prove that it is colorable with two times G of T many colors. So the only thing I, I claim, the only thing I have to do is to construct a graph G such that G is a minor of H and the chromatic number of H is bounded by twice the chromatic number of G. Why? Because once I know this, once I have, have this graph G, then simply because H doesn't have a KT minor also means that the graph G which is a minor of H, doesn't have a KT minor. 
So G has to be colorable with G of T many colors. And so I H is colorable with twice the amount of colors, right? So this is really all I have to do. If I manage to do this, extract a minor of H with at least half as much of the quadratic number, and which is a graph, then I'm done. So that's what I will do. And, and, and here's how you do it. So this is a, a greedy process, which I have applied successfully now for, to several problems. It's, it's a very simple idea, but for some reason, uh, it also applies to this hypergraph setting, and, and it, it's quite, quite nice, I think. So, so what you do is you decompose this given hypergraph H into disjoint sets, x1, x2, x3, and so on, up until some index, which is determined by the process, such that all these sets induce connected subhypergraphs and the, they are two colorable. So if you re restrict a hypergraph onto the sets, then uh, these are two colorable hypergraphs. And you construct it simply in a greedy fashion. So x1 will be chosen as a largest set with this property. And then in x2, you choose as a largest set uh, disjoint from x1 of this property. x3, you choose as a largest set uh, uh, in the remaining part of the uh, hypergraph with this property, and so on, until you have covered all the vertices. And this is a well-defined thing, because at any step, the worst case, you could take a single vertex, which uh, induces something connected and is one color rule. So this is always, it's always possible to continue, right? So you just do this process from left to right in some sense, and this gives you a partition into some number of sets, x1 up to, let's say, x6 in this case. Uh, it doesn't matter. It could be some large number. And um, each of these sets is connected and two color rule as a hypergraph. And what is very crucial that is that, that I do this maximality thing, so that the x x2 cannot be made larger um, this term from x1 and so on, because this will be now crucial uh, for, for the argument why the graph I construct actually bounds the chromatic number of this hypergraph as, uh, as well. So, so the way I construct the graph as a minor is very obvious. All these sets x1 up to x, x6, they are all connected, so I can just contract them. So after I contract them, I get six vertices, and the graph will be simply the, the, the part of, so this is still a hypergraph maybe, but I will just remove all the edges of this hypergraph, which contain more than two elements, and just restrict to all the graph edges, which uh, come out of this contraction process. So this graph is, will, will be defined on these contraction vertices as follows. I have an edge between one and two, for example, if and only if there exists some hyper edge in H, which lives in the union of x1 and x2, and intersects both of x1 and x2. Because this is what certify, certifies having a graph edge between the contraction vertex one and two uh, after doing the contractions. Okay, so this that's simply the graph. It's obviously a minor according to my definition. Uh, so all I have to show now is that this, so this is the graph G at the bottom. All I have to show now is that this graph G, uh, if I take its chromatic number times two, is an upper bound for the chromatic number of H. So suppose I have a proper, optimal proper coloring of, of this graph G, let's say with K colors. Um, what I will simply do is I will, I will split every color which I'm using for the coloring in G into a pair of colors, which I'm using on H in such a way that um, if, let's say, uh, this vertex two here received some color A, then I will be using, then I will be coloring this two colorable induced subgraph of H on X2 using the corresponding two colors, let's say A1 and A2, which is a color pair corresponding to A. Uh, this is the colors I will be using on X2, and it's possible because X2 by choice was two colorable, right? And in particular, it means that if I have two uh, different vertices, which had different colors, then the color sets of two colors I'm using or the corresponding blobs are disjoint from each other. Okay, so that's simply like a product coloring or something. That's what I'm doing, and I'm claiming it works. I'm claiming that this is a proper hypergraph coloring of H. And there's now, I mean, this is now the crucial part of the proof, why it's actually really a proper coloring. So let's prove this by contradiction. Suppose that in this coloring, in this product coloring, I, I have a monochromatic hyper edge. Right, so suppose this lives somewhere here. And, and let's just observe some, some facts about it. So, so this hyper, hyper edge will inter intersect some of these sets. It cannot live fully in one of the sets because each of the sets itself is properly colored with two colors. So it has to intersect at least two sets. Uh, in fact, it has to intersect at least three sets because if it would intersect only two sets, then uh, the fact that this hyper edge intersects both sets and uses the same color everywhere means that also the corresponding vertices down there would have had the same color, right? And this it's not possible because in this case, there's an edge between those two vertices, right? Uh, and this was a proper graph color. So really the case, the, the, the only bad case can be that I have a hyper edge intersecting at least three of these blobs, x1 up to x6, which is still monochromatic. And then I can uh, look at the blobs intersected by it, in this case, x3, x4, and x5, 
And I can focus on the leftmost blob in the second byte, x3 in this case. And now I will make a contradiction by saying, in this case, x3 was not chosen largest subject to the property we wanted. And so what I will simply say, I will claim that I can merge actually, okay, oh, so, sorry. So before I do this argument, let me observe something crucial here. Um, not only is it true that um, this hyper edge cannot only intersect two sets, but if I look at the, the set of things which it intersects, so in this case, three, four, and five, this must be in an independent set in the, in the graph G, right? Because again, uh, the fact that this hyper edge is monochromatic and intersects all these three blobs also means that the same color was used on three, four, and five in the graph coloring. So these, by definition of graph coloring, this ha ha had to be an independent set in the graph. There was no edge between three and four, no edge be between four and five, no edge between three and five. And this is what I will be using next. So, so now let's, let's, um, let's make the contradiction by saying that x3 was largest. So in order to make the contradiction, I will just basically join in this hyper edge uh, which intersected x3 into x3. So I will take the union of x3 with this hyper edge and claim that actually this set, which is obviously larger than x3, what already had the property that it was and used as a connected and two colorable subgraph of H disjoint from x1 and x2. So the connectivity thing is obvious because this hyper edge uh, just overlaps with x3, so it's connected. So why is it still two colorable, right? X3 was two colorable and now there comes this new hyper edge, why is it still two colorable? And here's the crucial, the crucial thing is that I, I'm overlapping with at least two other uh, blobs x4 and x5. So what I can do is I can take uh, a proper two coloring or the same proper two coloring of x3, which I was guaranteed by the choice of x3, let's say with colors uh, purple and orange. And now in order to extend this coloring on into this other hyper edge, I will use a color purple on, so I will, I will divide this hyper edge into, so let's just divide the, the, the blobs intersected by the hyper edge. In this case, there, there are two, just two other ones, x4 and x5, but they could be more. Let's divide these other blobs into two parts, two different parts, non-empty. In this case, it's just one part is x4, one part is x5. And I will use color purple on one part of uh, this partition and color uh, orange on the other part of this partition, okay? So, oops, uh, which means that in this case, I will color these vertices here uh, purple and the other vertices which uh, intersected uh, or were contained in x5, I will use orange on them. This is the way I will extend this uh, two coloring onto this hyper edge. And now I claim that this is still a proper coloring of the subhyper graph of H and used by X3 together with the vertices in this hyper edge. And here's the reason why this is true. In this example, at least, I mean, there's a slightly more general argument that the hyper edge intersects more than three sets, but uh, it's basically the same. So suppose that this would not be a proper coloring, then there would have to be some other hyper edge contained in this, uh, the union of these two sets, which is monochromatic. Well, it's, it, it doesn't live just in X3 because X3 was properly colored. So it uses some of these additional vertices here. So either it's monochromatic in purple and intersects the X4 vertices, or it's monochromatic in orange and intersects the X5 vertices. And in, so, so also we can assume without loss of generality from the beginning, which I forgot to mention, by the way, I'm sorry for that, that in H, uh, I don't have two hyper edges containing each other. And the reason is simply that uh, if you have a hypergraph uh, where several edges contain each other, you can just take the inclusion-wise minimal hyper edges in the hypergraph, and any proper coloring of this, this sub-hypergraph will still be a proper coloring of the full hypergraph. So without loss of generality, we can always assume in these considerations that no two hyper edges contain each other, which means that if I have a conflict hyper edge here, that's what I want to say, it also cannot live just in the right-hand side part. It must use both vertices from X3 and from the right-hand side part. So the only options really are, there's a hyper edge which is purple and looks like this, but why is this not possible? Well, this means that there was actually a graph edge between three and four originally, right? That's a contradiction, right? So this is impossible. Um, and the other option would be that there's something orange, which looks like this, but then there would be a graph edge between three and five. That's also impossible. So, so more generally, what the argument does is it says that if there would be some, if you join this hyper edge uh, into X3, and basically, so, so initially, I didn't explain this very formally, but what you do in the formal proof is that you say, if there's some monochromatic conflict in this coloring, pick such a conflict which minimizes the number of overlaps with, uh, of the hyper edge with sets x1 up to x6. Uh, and then looking at the, the minimal, overlap, minimal conflict in that sense, you know that any other smaller conflict that could be created in this way is not possible anymore. It's, it's basically just a generalization of this argument here in this example, but, but you can just believe me that there's a generalization. So basically I can deduce from the fact that the graph coloring was proper and 
and this maximality restriction on the choice of the sets, that this is also a proper hypergraph color. Okay, so that's the, the, that's the conclusion of the proof because this shows that I constructed a minor, which is a graph, and such a coloring the graph of k colors, I can 2k color the whole hypergraph. So that conclu concludes already the proof of the main results. Uh, and, and, and that's it. Maybe if you have any questions at this point, it's good to ask because. I... Yeah, so uh, when you, when you, we're assuming that edges didn't contain other hyper edges. Yes. That's good for coloring, but what about minors? I was just concerned about. No, like but when... I'm moving to a sub hypergraph, uh, right? So, so what I'm saying is take H in the beginning, which is KT minor three. Now move to the sub hypergraph, which only includes those edges in H, which are inclusion wise minimal. This is a sub hypergraph of H, so it's still KT minor three, and it has the property we want. Right? So that's what right. I do. Right. Okay. Good. Let's, let's hope this was somewhat clear. Then, uh, then, okay, actually, this is already, as I said, I have some other results, but uh, also about, I have some results about fractional coloring of these hypergraphs. On the, I will not mention them because they are ba largely based on the same idea. And, and, and also, this other result is more technical. What, what I want to do for the rest of the talk is, and this is what I've written here, is applications. So I really think that this, even though the proof is rather simple, and, and uh, I still think that the res result is sufficiently general that there should be some nice applications of it. And I, I think I have, I have a list of three of them. I, I would like the list to be much longer, uh, but, but I didn't find. I, I wasn't creative enough to find more nice applications, but, but let me show you the ones I had, right? And, and let me convince you that I think you can do actually something non-trivial non with, this, with this argument. So, so here's, here's one thing, one problem which I, I find natural, which I've asked myself before. So suppose, uh, I mean, what does, uh, what do complete minus actually guarantee, right? So uh, if, let's say Hartwig's conjecture is true, or we know it's an atotic form is true. So we know that if a graph has high quadratic number in T, it contains a KT minor, which is just like this collection of connected disjoint uh, T subgraphs having pairwise one edge in between. So in some sense, we, 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 think, we, we like to think of this as something of KT as a dense structure, right? And, and we also know that graphs of high quadratic number should contain dense parts in some sense. But still, this, uh, this minor certificate by itself could be something very loosely connected, something very sparse, in the sense that all the, the branch sets uh, which are connected, they could just be some trees. They can just be trees, uh, spanning trees uh, of these, of these uh, branch sets. Uh, and in between, I can have exactly one edge. So this could be like even a graph of maximum degree three. It could be something very sparse. You don't really have anything more than connectivity inside the branch that's guaranteed by Hartwig. And it seems very natural to ask, can we not somehow actually say something stronger if we assume that the chromatic number is slightly higher? Can we not maybe say that, OK, actually, the branches, I can assume that they are k-connected for some number k, which I can choose arbitrarily large. And can I maybe get more than one edge between every two branches? I think this is uh, quite a natural question. Also. Uh, having in the back of my mind. Um, so while asking this question, I also had in the back of my mind that basically, if you can enforce a higher connectivity on top of the branch sets, you will be able to embed actually subdivisions of graphs into, into these minor models instead of just uh, subdivisions of cubic graphs as you can usually do for, uh, for minors. Okay, but that's just as a general motivation for, for what I'm saying. So I, I'm saying you can actually prove the form of this result using my hypergraph uh, result. I claim that you can force high edge connectivity at the very least on, on these branches just by paying a small factor on top of the chromatic number. So this would be a picture where every branch set is actually two edge connected and between any pair of branches, I have at least two edges. Something like this is what I'm looking for. And, and this is what I, can, what I can prove. So suppose you have any graph G whose chromatic number exceeds two times K times G of T. So G of T is the same thing as before, the maximum chromatic number of K T minor three graphs. So this is some number K times T times log log T times a constant. So any graph G bigger than that, uh, with correct number bigger than that, contains a KT minor model with T different branch sets, such that each of them induces a K edge connected subgraph, and such that there are at least K edges between any pair of branch sets. I couldn't find this result anywhere in literature. I think it's a very natural thing to look for. And the nice thing really about it is that it falls out immediately from the hypergraph result with like uh, basically a half page proof at most, if you write it long. So here's a proof. So let H be, so we, we take this graph G with chromatic number bigger than two times K times G of T, uh, and K is any number, by the way. Um, now we define an auxiliary hypergraph. The hypergraph has the same word set as G, 
and we put a hyper edge on a subset of vertices in G, if and only if the subset of vertices in G induces a subgraph which is KH connected. That's as simple as it gets, right? So we just take the same vertex as a G. Now we put hyper edges for subsets which induce KH connected subgraphs. That's a well defined thing. Could be empty, could be it could be anything, right? Define this hypergraph. Now, what do we know about this hypergraph? It has a nice property because we know something about um, graph of high chromatic number. And this is the following. So suppose you have a graph, any graph of chromatic number bigger than k. I claim that such a graph always has a kh connected subgraph. And this is a very well known fact. Uh, the easiest way to prove it is to do the following. So uh, say you have a graph of chromatic number bigger than k, then by just remo removing edges and vertices, as long as you have this property, you can assume it's a k plus one uh, edge critical for coloring. So removing any edge or vertex reduces the chromatic number from k plus one to k. And when you're in this situation, it's a very well-known fact for, of critical graphs that they are k edge connected. k plus one critical graph is k edge connected. You can see this by a simple permutation argument by looking at a, at a sparse cut. So we know that every graph from number bigger than k has a k edge connected subgraph. And thinking about this in terms of this hypergraph, which we have, it means that if you have an independent set in the, in the hypergraph H, the same set will induce a k colorable subgraph of G. Right? And the reason is that um, if this uh, induced subgraph uh, induced by the independent set would be of product number bigger than k, then by the previous argument, it would, there would be some kh connected subset in it, which would also be kh connected to the whole graph g. So this would be an hyper edge contained in this independent set in the hypergraph. But that's not possible. So really, every independent set in h is a k colorable graph in g, which means that if I can color h by some number of k, k of, uh, no, that's not called k, p of color number. A of colors, then G is also colorable by K times A colors, right? Because every independent set, I can just use a factor of K more colors uh, to get actually proper graph coloring, right? Okay, so we assume initially that G is by a factor of two times, uh, or by, by a factor of K larger than two times G of T. So now this implies that G, uh, that H, sorry, will have chromatic number bigger than two times G of T, which is exactly the thing we prove for the hypergraph at bigger result. So this now implies that H as a hypergraph as kt as a minor. And I'm claiming this one-to-one -one translates into the thing we want. Because what it means, if, we, if you think about it uh, in terms of these minor models, these are p disjoint subsets of the same vertex set as, as of g, such that each of them is connected in this, in this hypergraph h. But really what this means is that this is basically a connected collection of subsets of what is, what is a connected hypergraph where every edge of this hypergraph corresponds to something which is k edge connected. And then you make a simple observation that if you have two different vertex sets in a, uh, which both induce something KH connected in G and they overlap in some set of vertices, then the union is still KH connected. That's the nice thing about edge connectivity. Even if they just share one vertex, the union is still KH connected. Uh, so this means that every branch set in this hypergraph which is connected will be a KH connected subgraph of G. And also we know that between any pair of these branch sets, I will have some hyper edge which means I will have some k-edge connected subgraph which has vertices both on both sides. So there should be at least k-edges in between left and the right side just because this hyper-edge which goes in between was something k-edge connected. So that's it. That proves the, the result. It's directly from the other thing. All I use is this, a very simple property of, k, uh, of critical graphs. Right? And basically you can do this for any property of uh, critical graphs. If you know any property of critical graphs, you can define a hypergraph in the same way. Um, and, and get some additional property on top of the branch sets, which you wouldn't get in the ordinary hard figure by paying a small factor of, on, on a chromatic number. OK, so this is one, one example. I will have another example later. But now let me first show the original motivation for looking at these problems, which was this uh, strong complete minor problem in diagrams. So this I kind of solved previously with a similar method, and then I noticed this generalization. And now I'm presenting it the other way around. Now I, I will represent it as a special case. And again, the proof will be very short having this more general setup in mind. So, so this is a definition which people have used in minor theory for digraphs a lot. So a strong minor, uh, f of another digraph d, um, is certified by the following um, minor model. So it's very similar to what we have before, had before. So uh, for every vertex in f, in this digraph f, I will have a disjoint, strongly connected subset or subdigraph of d. Um, so, so in this setting, contract, contracting corresponds to contracting strongly connected subsets, basically. And what I also want is that every arc in the digraph F is represented between the corresponding branch sets. 
in this in this collection of prime sets, right? So I'm saying a digraph D contains another digraph F as a strong minor. If there's this branch set collection of strongly connected subsets, such that after correcting these sets, I basically get that. I get, I get that. and deleting some additional superfluous edges. Okay, so so this is a standard notion which people have studied, and uh, here's an example just that you see what I mean. So if D is, is this kind of thing, and you have this directed cycles here which make the branches strongly connected, then you're allowed to contract them, and you you preserve the edges between the blobs, so you get this. In this case, you get a complete digraph on free vertices with all possible six arcs in all directions. Okay, so that, that's that's what strong minus are. And and people have independently previously um, asked the question or studied the question: um, What can you say about colorings of digraphs which exclude a complete digraph on T vertices as a as a strong minor? So Aksinovich, Girao, and Snead and Weber in 2021 they proved that there exists some upper bound for this function, which is by itself not obvious. So they proved that if you have no strong KT minor as a digraph, then you can color we're using exponentially many colors in T, such that each color class of this coloring induces an acyclic subdigraph. So this kind of notion of coloring, this is also called dichromatic number, uh, is actually studied by quite some people nowadays. So, so this is just like the coloring is not the same as a graph coloring where edges have to be properly colored. Uh, but all you want is that there's no directed cycles which fully lives in one color. And, and they studied this in relation to the strong minors and proved some upper bound in terms of T. And then asked, they asked for better bounds. And uh, with uh, Tamash Misamos, 2021, I, I had this, I discovered a similar idea, which proved this T times log log T upper bound, the same as for hard figures. Uh, it's totally the same as for hard figures problem, also in this digraph setting. And what I want to say now is that actually this proof, which we had back then, doesn't need digraphs at all. And it directly follows from, uh, from uh, this hypergraph setup. Um, I also realized, yeah, sorry. I, I also want to mention that Back then, we still thought that maybe it's true. The best lower bound we construct, uh, could construct on a chromatic number of diagrams about a strong KT minor was T. So we thought that maybe we asked whether it's true that graphs without a, a strong KT minor are T colorable in that sense of all. So there was no problem. Uh, and coming from this hypergraph perspective, I also, not only did I, did I discover that the, our theorem, which we proved is a simple special case of it, but also I discovered that the, the, the problem we posed has a negative answer. So. So let me show both of these things. So firstly, let me give you this very short proof uh, that the diagram about a strong KT minor is O of T log log T colorable. So what we do, and actually I claim it's colorable by the same function as hypergraphs without a KT minor. So what you simply do is this. So, so suppose you are given the diagram about a strong KT minor, and now I construct another auxiliary diagram, again on the same vertex set as D, which simply has a hyper edge for every cycle. That's it. So for every directed cycle in D, take its vertex set, this is my hyper edge. Right? So just take the collection of all these sets. It's, the nice thing about this is that directly, one-to-one, -one, you can see that the chromatic number of this hypergraph is the same as the dichromatic number or whatever like this, uh, you want to call this chromatic number of the digraph itself when you want to color without monochromatic directed cycles. Right? Because in the hypergraph, you want to color without monochromatic hyper edges. Now we want to color without monochromatic directed cycles. So if you make the directed cycles the hyper edges, then it will work out. Right? So this, the chromatic number of this hypergraph is exactly the dichromatic number of our digraph. And now the other thing which works out nicely together is that if H of D would contain KT as a minor, then what, we, what you would get is that you would have T different vertex subsets of, uh, of D, each of them connected in this hypergraph, but this hypergraph just consists of direct cycles. So if you're connected in this hypergraph, it's very easy to see that all these things are actually strongly connected. And you also have that between any two sets, you will have one directed cycle in the second both of them and living in a union. So there will be edges in both ways. So you will get all the necessary arcs to build a strong KT minor. So I'm saying if H of D, this hypergraph, contains KT as a minor, and actually D contains K, the complete digraph on T, which is a strong minor. But it doesn't, right? So H of D is KT minor free. So D and therefore H, H of D and therefore D are O of T log of T colorable. So it's direct from this general setup. And this is what I really like about it, that you can easily deduce these results without much work. Okay, um, here's the negative answer to the other thing. So, so we asked whether we can actually decolor these graphs and it's not true. Be and the only reason I, I observed this is that I knew that for hypergraphs it wasn't true. And the hypergraph example I gave you earlier, the complete free uniform hypergraph, you cannot express this as a digraph. You cannot have a digraph where every triple forms a directed cycle. Um, unless you also have some digons and so this changes uh, the game. Um, so, so this, uh, this doesn't work immediately, but there's a different construction, which is very similar, 
which actually can be realized by a digraph and achieves the same bound. So I'm, I'm, I'm saying there is a hypergraph uh, realizable as a digraph in this way without a strong KT minor, which requires at least three half times C minus one colors in every acyclic color. And the construction is simply like this. You take uh, three different copies of a complete digraph on T minus one vertices, uh, and then you add the, the edges in a circular manner in all possible ways. So these are complete bipartite graphs going in a cir uh, circular manner. And uh, it's, again, very easy to observe that if you have any set of three vertices in this, in this digraph, they will span at least one direct cycle. Either there will be two vertices in the same set, then there will be a digon, or they are each one from uh, these three different sets, and then there will be a direct triangle. So every color can show in, a, in an acyclic coloring can show up at most twice. So you need at least this many colors as I'm claiming. So that's easy. And why does this thing again not contain a strong KT minor? It's, it's a very similar reason as before. So, so first of all, just for, for space reasons, you can observe that there has to be uh, uh, some branches of which is a singleton. Otherwise, you Every other branch that has to be of size at least three. I uh, know, oh, sorry. Uh, I'm always making this argument wrong. Uh, so, okay, there's a, you can easily see that there has to be one branch that, if you want a strong KT minor model, which fully, leaves in, fully lives in one of the three blobs. And the reason for this is that if you want to be strongly connected, and this is what the branches should be, you either live fully in one blob or you intersect each three of the blobs. But if you intersect only exactly two of the blobs, you will not be strongly connected because you will have a direct cut in the middle. So this means that every branch that either has at least three elements from each of these sets or lives in one blob. But for space reasons, because we need T sets and, uh, and you have at most T minus one on each of these blobs, there will be one, has to be one blob in this branch set model, which fully lives in one part, let's say in the bottom part. And now the point is that um, you can again argue that not every other branch that can intersect the bottom part because there's T of them and only T minus one branches intersect the bottom part. So there's again some other branch that which lives in a different part. Right? So there's, let's say, a branch which fully lives in the top right part and a branch which fully lives in the top bottom part, but then there's no edge. Then, then, then it's not true that there's edges in both directions between them because there's only one way between them how edges can go. So this is by a short argument why this doesn't have a strong key minor. Um, this is real, realizable as a digraph. So Hadwig also doesn't realize the digraphs, doesn't realize the hypergraphs, and so on. So that, that's just the purpose of this uh, construction. Uh, okay. Now, I will finish the talk with my third application now. And this time I will not give the proof because it's really exactly the same as I showed you previously. This is just an example that you can really get all kind of additional properties on top of branches in a KT minor without much work. So in this case, I will. Uh, this is similar to the to KH connected thing, but I, I'm going for a different kind of connectivity. So instead of saying I want to be KH connected, what I'm saying is I want that the branches are connected modulo some number, Q. So Q is some integer. And I want that between any two distinct vertices in the same branch set, I can choose the length of my path between them mod q, right? So for every residue from zero up until q minus one, I would like to have a path from u to v of length congruent to r modulo q. This is what I call a modulo q connected graph. I don't think anyone has used this definition before, but it's, I think it's natural. Uh, so so I'm, I'm claiming that while a KT minor model in general could be, for example, a bipartite graph or something, if you have high chromatic number, you know that you must contain some odd parts. You actually must contain some parts which don't work together well with modulo Q stuff. You, you will have cycles of all parities mod Q and so on. So it's not very natural to expect that the statement like this is true, that you, you can actually get branches to be connected also in this modular, modular way. And, and again, as a direct consequence of this hypergraph result, just by paying a constant factor times Q on top of what you need for hypergraph conjecture, you can get this. And the proof is the same. You will set up a hypergraph where a subset uh, um, is in, the, is in the hypergraph if and only if it has a certainly high chromatic number. And then in this, you can, oh, and is modulo Q connected. And then you will use the fact that every graph of sufficiently high chromatic number will contain a modulo Q connected subgraph, which you can prove using other, other results from literature. literature. Um, and, and then you get it directly from, from the hypergraph. Below. So I'm not sure how interesting other people find this, but I personally find it quite interesting that you can somehow easily with the hypergraph uh, minor result enforce additional structure on top of the branch set, which are usually guaranteed by chromatic number, but now you can also guarantee within the minor. Uh, okay, that's it. Uh, I will wrap up the talk now. So, so here are three open problems. And the first is not really a problem, but just like I'm asking people to actually, if they have anything in mind, like find new, new applications for this result. I hope that there's more applications and not only these three. Um, the second open problem is uh, that I, I cannot prove my conjecture that KT minor free graphs are free half times T minus one colorable. 
even in the smallest case of k free minor free hypergraphs. And this sounds like uh, this should be simple and so on, but but you 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 do remember that the, the class of even k to minor free hypergraphs is qu quite structurally rich and so on. So it's it's not it's not quite easy to understand what are k free minor free hypergraphs, and therefore obtaining a tight bound and correct number might not be very easy. But I, I think this could be true. Uh, my 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 proof just gives a four color, not a three color. Another question goes in the direction of what I said in the beginning. But what happens if we don't exclude a graph, but actually a, a hypergraph, really, which doesn't have graph edges, like a free uniform complete hypergraph, for example? Uh, then we cannot talk to a bound chromatic number of a, of a hypergraph if it has graph edges. But what if we exclude graph edges? So suppose you have a graph where every edge has a size at least three, and it doesn't have a complete free uniform hypergraph as a minor. Can we then bound a chromatic number? I don't know whether this is true, and I would be, I think this is, would be very interesting uh, to also look in this direction. Um, that's it. Thank you for your attention. Uh, and yeah, please ask questions if you have any. OK, so uh, on the count of three, let's uh, unmute and give Raphael a round of applause. One, two, three. Okay. Are, are there any questions? I had a question. So I was, I was wondering, you said that you have quite a few examples of uh, hypergraphs that meet the 3 over 2. Mm -hmm. I was wondering they are if all there's independence number two examples, by the way. Sorry? They are all independence number two examples. So they are all similar in spirit to the other construction. Oh, OK. They have oh, all very few vertices and independence number two. So the reason for the quadratic number is always the same. So, yeah, okay. but sorry. Yeah, I was just wondering if some that okay. we were related mm -hmm. to some interesting theorems. So I think the, but the no, no, more... I don't have a general setup. I just, I just figured there's many ways of doing it. Yeah. Okay. And another question is: Have you thought about trying to get your sine graph result as a? Yes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the, it's quite funny. So I have I know this result about hypergraphs since a longer time than I know the result about the sine graphs. And actually, this is what inspired me to find the proof for the sign graphs, not the other way around. OK. <laughs> Which is quite funny. But, uh, so, so, but I don't think you can get this in the setup. That's actually something you could, what you could do is, so the hypergraph result in itself does not directly imply the sign graphs as far as I know. But you could formulate a stronger statement than the one I'm proving, which would imply it. I guess you could also like, but I, it, it wouldn't be very natural. So I didn't do it. Okay. You you could you could define something like this odd minus maybe also in the type graph setting, but uh, yeah, it, it it would it didn't feel natural, so I didn't do it. Yeah. If you could it be possible to get even a, like a a weaker version of it somehow straight from hypergraphs? Hmm. Yeah, not sure. Maybe. Any other it's a setup? I, I I love the results. Thanks. You say that this notion of hypergraph minors is is your notion, and other people haven't used it. I, okay, I, this I I really don't want to claim this uh, formally, but like I'm just saying that my literature research, as far as I did it, and I tried to do my best, I, I didn't find anything which does this. I mean, I I found related things. I, I, for example, I found a definition in the I found a Stack Overflow post or something like this by Dominic van der Zuyven. He, he uh, suggested also something like a hypergraph version of particles conjecture, but his notion of minus was, was much, much weaker in the sense that you could do this kind of thing that um, shrink edges, right? So you could delete vertices and shrink hyper edges. And also, um, in some sense, he didn't require the branches to be connected by themselves, but you could somehow use help or help uh, the make make the thing connected, the branches connected by using hyper edges from the outside and something. It, it, it was quite different and much weaker. For example, in this definition, if you take a, just one hyper edge which contains T vertices and nothing else, this would already contain a KT minor, which which I found which I don't find very natural. So so um, th there are some versions of minus which I mean this is one of one of the things I found. I, I know that um, that other people I mean I know that there's definitions for simplicial complexes. Um, yeah, I, there, there's, there's several definitions, <laughs> but- uh, well, I mean, the, 
the reason I asked about this is it. that there are, there are lots of things that are known about miners for graphs, and you've you've generalized them in beautiful ways for coloring, but mm -hmm. there are lots of other things that one could potentially generalize them to. Yes. Have you given any thought to any of those things? Yes, this is what a bit what I had on this very short slide in the beginning where I said that I, I don't expect a nice structure theorem and stuff like that. I mean, obviously, I, 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 can, I cannot prove that there's no nice structure theorem, but I'm just saying that the the, the class of KT minor graphs, hypergraphs will be much richer in some sense uh, and, and be different from what we, are, what we know from graphs. And also the degeneracy results are not true anymore. So at least not in the form, I, not in the obvious form. So... Uh, I think these these other things I, I kind of think about at least degeneracy structure theorem and so on they will be much harder to do if at all. Okay. Um, but maybe there's other aspects which I didn't think about. For example, I think uh, actually this notion of minus, strangely as it sounds, I think harmonizes well with a chromatic polynomial. <laughs> this is one thing I which is which I discovered. So there, this is a classical deletion projection trick for the recursion of a chromatic polynomial for graphs, which also works exactly with the same definition for hypergraph, con uh, hypergraph edge contraction, uh, edge contraction I'm using here. So in that sense, it also works well together. Uh, by the way, I should also say that uh, Johannes Kahn is in because he, he's here. He, he also has a lot of work on, on various forms of minus uh, for, for simplicial complexes and embeddings of these things in, in higher dimensional space, uh, which is, again, a completely different story and uh, doesn't directly relate to it. but. Yeah, I'm, there, there's really a bunch of different no, minor notions, but none of them, as far as I figured out, is exactly what I'm doing. So that's all I know. Thank you. Okay. I, I think I'll uh, I'll stop the recording and we can continue the discussion yeah. off the air. Okay.